Hello, hello, everybody. It's me. How are you doing this evening, my friends? Yes, yes, yes. I know. I have things to talk about myself, of course, which are all fascinating to everyone, I'm sure. But it's late. Didn't really feel like heading into the studio. Let's just have... I suppose a little chat. How was your day? How is your evening going? And what's uh, what's new in your world? And uh, yeah, sorry, it took a little while to get uh, started. But uh, hi, everybody. How are you? Uh, how are you doing? Let's uh, let's go down the beautiful Molly Hole. Hmm. Ah. Uh, I, uh, it's nice to see my proctologist here as well. Always a, always a, a grand plus. And let's see how is yeah. So listen, you got to remember. Um, I've talked about this for a while. That yeah, I got I got booted off Twitter. Uh, yes, that's right. It's nice to see that Twitter is talking to tech journalists before they would say talk to me. Yeah, uh, Parler, you can follow me on a uh, Parler. Just go to freedomain.com forward slash connect and you can um, uh, you can follow me on various social media platforms and so on. And uh, so are you really in a good mood? You know, these things are always mixed. These things are always mixed. There's pluses, there's minuses, there's complexities and all of that. So um it's uh eh, it could be could be a uh, quite the quite the conversation. Call into the kill stream. I must say that uh, seems a little sinister, <laughs> if that makes any sense. So, kill stream is a good idea. So, parlor is a honeypot. I don't know what that means. I'm happily married. So. Um, yeah. What's the story with Killstream? Who is the Killstream? Why is the Killstream? Purple Monkey Dishwasher. Yes, I will say it. It's like the guy who does, don't they do these, um, honest movie trailers? In a town where, you know. Uh, I'm still mad there's no more Doom Eternal gameplay. I'll get round to it. I'll get round to it. But it will take a little while. Uh, it will take a little while. The Ralph Retort. I've seen that. I've seen that. Ethan Ralph runs the kill stream. I don't still really know what that means. But hey, I'm willing to be schooled. I'm willing to be educated. I'm willing to be uh, schooled uh, on all this kind of stuff. So Ethan Ralph is inviting you on. Oh, the Killstream is a harmless podcast. Great guys over there. They're eager to talk to you. Are you going to start using Parler in a similar style as to how you use your Twitter? Yeah, I imagine that uh, I will. Uh, I will be doing that, and this channel will grow. So, yeah, all right. Let's uh, let's have a talk. And um, so it's interesting. Um, so this afternoon, I was, well, actually yesterday and today for a good chunk of the day. Uh, there's an old saying from Winston Churchill where he said, I'm sorry this letter is so long, I didn't have time to make it shorter. Making things short and snappy and concentrated and pithy and readable and deep and meaningful is a really, really complex job. So I was working on, I guess, a fairly short essay called What I Believe, which has, I guess, been used by our good friends, the Marxists, uh, in, in the past. And in the what I believe, I wanted to lay out my major perspectives on a variety of issues from, you know, reality to virtue, to truth, to race, to relationships between men and women, to uh, family, to you, you name it. I really wanted to sort of crush and concentrate these arguments down, not necessarily because I thought it would change a whole bunch of people's minds who were, you know, already said dead set against me or anything, but because it's a place, you know, where you can send people, if you want, uh, who believe things about me that just, you know, really aren't so much with the truth. And at least they can get it from the horse's mouth, uh, so to speak. Me, me, that is. 
whether uh, whether they accept it or not, I don't know, but it's a better chance than if there's nothing, right? So let me just, uh, I'll give you guys the link here. And uh, hopefully that will uh, make some kind of sense to you. Let me just go over here and put it into, put it in, put it in. There we go. All right. Message there. So, uh, do you regret speaking so much on the IQ argument, knowing all the backlash it was receiving? Um, no, I, I don't. I mean, if you know something that's really important that can help bring some peace and reason and understanding to the world, is it really that reasonable to not talk about it and then just sort of sit here, look in the camera and say, I want to tell you guys the truth and courage is a virtue and truth is a virtue. And, you know, that really isn't the way. How many bots did you have responding to your own tweet? Oh, yeah. So as far as I understand it, uh, Twitter says that they kicked me off for spam and platform manipulation, specifically operating fake accounts. What is a bot account? A bot account is something that programs? You, you program it to provide particular responses? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what uh, what they mean by that. So, yeah, I don't. Uh, um, is there any video so we can see your devilish good looks, Stefan? Is there? There is video, isn't there? Can you guys see me? You can see me, right? Hello. If East Asians always come out on top in IQ research, why are you considered a white supremacist? I don't know that I'm considered a white supremacist. It's just a label that people use to try and keep other people away from the arguments that I put forward. So, let's see here. Yeah, you can see you can see me fine, right? So, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I, I thought about this, obviously, because last week it was uh, YouTube. It was a 14-year investment, and this year it was Twitter. It was sort of an 11-year investment. So, yeah, I mean, massive swaths of you know, thousands of hours and, and massive swaths of your life just kind of carved off, you know, like a bunch of jackals fighting over a um, roast turkey or something. And it's tough, though, because... If you bite your tongue about things that are important, and for, for me, for me, I don't feel regret as long as I always speak out of love, as long as I always speak out of, you know, care and concern for the world and really gen like I want the races to get along better. I want men and women to get along better. I want families to get along better. I want children not to be hit. Uh, you know, it's a shame that with all this political stuff comes the silencing of, you know, a pretty powerful voice for peaceful parenting and children's rights and reminding everyone that they kind of need to focus on the benefit for children and all of that. It's a, I mean, it's a real shame with all of that stuff. Um, it's, you know, if you have an idea in your head that you, you know, is valid and listen, you know, with IQ stuff, I really did work hard to validate it. I had, I think 17 or 18 world renowned experts on the show to to talk about it and give the facts and all that so i was as responsible as a human being can be with that kind of information and if that means you can't speak then it means that it's kind of a it's kind of a medieval worldview right where science is considered the enemy of the ideology you know, whether that ideology is say the earth-centered universe or whatever if you live in a superstitious age where you know science facts reason and truth become the enemy of people and you are well it's kind of like blasphemy rules so to speak right you can't say this you can't say that i mean what are your choices you roll over and just say okay well uh, i'm not going to talk about essential truths well which are kind of necessary because you understand, like, I mean, if this race baiting continues, I mean, things get really, really bad indeed. And so if you are in possession of a truth that is really important to help keep peace in the world as best you can, and you don't say it, 
that's pretty rough, man. I mean, that's that's then you kind of need a different gig than philosophy. You kind of need a different gig than truth telling, because if you give up on that stuff, I'm not really sure what, <laughs> what you're doing. I'm not really sure what the plan is as a whole. So no, I don't. Uh, I don't have uh, any any regrets. I do think it would be better because. I mean, social media companies do have an enormous amount of power at the moment, and they've largely managed to gather that power. So I'm going to just sit up a little more comfortably here. They've largely managed to gather that power because of their Section 230 immunities from content, right? Uh, liability for content, as you know. And so if the power has been accumulated because they're acting as a public utility, but then the bans appear to be motivated close to an election by people who were somewhat sympathetic to President Trump in 2015, 2016. It just seems like a very tough circle to square, right? You only have this power because you promise to be neutral. And if you use that power in ways that at least don't appear to a lot of people to be super neutral, that's a real, that's a real challenge. But, you know, there's lots of different ways to serve a cause. You can serve a cause by standing up and speaking out. And sometimes you can serve a cause by, say, being deplatformed and alarming people about the true state of free speech in America, right? America is supposed to be the bastion of free speech. It is the place where, you know, people around the world envy the First Amendment enormously. The fact that there's no such thing as hate speech in American law, that's a very positive and powerful thing. So sometimes the cause of free speech is served by speaking up and being part of the conversation. And sometimes the cause of free speech is served by not being part of the conversation. In other words, being deplatformed and thus perhaps even alarming people about the true state of free speech in the world so that they can talk about it with people. They can talk about it with peers, with friends, with family and so on. And you know, maybe there's some significant power that can come out of those kinds of conversations. So you've got to speak. You've got to speak. And I suppose you you take your lumps. Because if you silence yourself, then you you don't have that right anyway. Do, do you know what I mean? Is that all like better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all? Better to have spoken and be silenced than never to have spoken at all and thus be silenced anyway. Do you understand? So, I think that is... Does he ever read chat? Yes. Best of luck, Steph. Please consider apologizing to Nick. He took what you did very personally. Um, he has the right to follow or not follow whoever he wants, and he would get no complaint from me. And I have the right to follow and not follow whoever I want. That's just the way of things. There were lots of people that I followed. Lots of people when I did a review, I'm like, mm, I don't really listen to them anymore. I don't, maybe I don't agree with them as much, or I just don't find them as interesting, or my roster is too full. And so there's people who I didn't follow. And I don't know, the personal thing? I don't know. Like, I mean, there is, I mean, there are people who follow me and then people who unfollow me. And I'm not sure that I would ever take that uh, personally, if that makes sense. Let's see here. Uh, if you had Trump's ear to say one thing, what would you tell him? Considering his personality, how would you phrase it? Well, you know, that's interesting. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't really remember really thought about it, but there is something interesting, you know, as part of me was thinking tonight, but that there is actually a kind of pro-Trump contingency, I think, in some of these social media companies. Because by golly, you really couldn't serve Trump's campaign more than kicking people off social media platforms. Because if that doesn't energize Trump's base, I really don't know what will. And here's the funny thing too, and I've said this a bunch of times, like I, I haven't really done anything on the 2020 US election. And I actually had no particular plans to do anything on the 2020 US election for the simple reason that the left was, or the, I mean, at the hard left, I don't mean sort of the moderate left, the hard left was 
doing their wildest stuff, you know, like taking over parts of Seattle and tearing down monuments and attacking people and so on. So the far left was doing some pretty nutty stuff that was, I'm pretty sure, more vivid and powerful than any PowerPoint presentation that I could put together. So I wasn't really doing much and I had no plans to do anything in particular with regards to the 2020 U.S. election. But I do think that the best way to energize, whether, I mean, there's people on the left and people on the right who both value free speech. I'm really talking about that aspect. I think it's a little bit more on the right at the moment. Generally, the left was more into free speech in the 60s before they gained control of masses of institutions. The left was very keen on um, free speech. But now, of course, that they've got control of a bunch of institutions, the commitment to free speech seems to be slipping a little. Is that is that the way to put it? Slipping just a, a smidge? And so for those who are interested in free speech, who tend to be on the right at the moment, could switch later. It almost couldn't, you almost couldn't do more to energize than, you know, to, to lie about people and then to, um, uh, to platform them and, and whatever it is, right? Because that, should, you know, sends a pretty clear message across the world about um, who has the power and who doesn't have the power and all of that. So um, I think in a funny way, there are a bunch of uh, um, pro-Trumpers in these social media companies because they really are... Um, They really are energizing Trump space, I think, pretty pretty heavily. All right. Unfollowing is not the same as disavow. Oh, good heavens, no. Good heavens, no. Oh, <laughs> chain yourself to Twitter headquarters. I won't be. Uh, I won't be. <laughs> Twitter can rest easy. They. I will not be chaining myself. What platform do you think you'll be more active on now? Well, that's interesting. I mean, that's an interesting question. I've been sort of thinking about that. I mean, I, I think I did some good on Twitter. I was getting close to half a million followers. And the essay, which I'm very pleased of, I hope you guys will check out. I'll put it in the show notes. Um, I was just about to post on Twitter. I think I think I was doing some real good there. Now, if I spend an hour, if I have an hour a day free from Twitter, and sometimes it was more, um, it wasn't always like I'm just sitting there staring at Twitter. It could be like I was doing something else, and I would check it once in a while. But... There's that's time to start writing another book, right? I've been asked to write a book on peaceful parenting. I don't even know how many thousands of times over the years. I really should get into that. I'd like to write a book called Practical Philosophy about how to bring philosophy to bear in your everyday life, uh, which is kind of like what I do with my call-in shows and all of that. I've been very interested in that kind of work as well. So uh, I don't know. It could be a little bit less when it comes to social media and a little bit more on um, producing longer works, if that makes sense. What's your perspective on Sargon of Akkad? Why? Well, he's a very interesting guy, a very genial guy, lovely voice, and um, it seems uh, I didn't have any particular issues with him. Uh, Steph, I appreciate what you do, but I hope we can all realize that no amount of playing the left's game will ever appease them. I don't know what you mean by playing the left's game. I'm really just trying to work with reason and evidence here. Are you the guy who was kicked off Twitter? Uh, I am. Well, I'm a guy who was kicked off Twitter. If I'm the guy, I don't. Uh, probably not. Let's see here. Twitter and YouTube are doing all they can to help Trump win by banning people like you. They are showing everyone why we need free speech. Yes, I think that is actually quite uh, quite an important point. Glad you're on DLive. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Statues are the thing that finally woke people up. Yeah, I know this attack on statues. I mean, it definitely happened in the um, 19, late 1940s, early 1950s in Mao's China, right? I mean, they had all of these, the hallmarks of this stuff. Uh, you knew you were class enemy, you were lied about, and then well, I guess you were kind of deplatformed in a way, uh, not allowed to participate in civil society anymore. And they did tear down a lot of statues and they destroyed a lot of historical monuments. And I mean, ISIS did the same thing when they went into uh, Iraq and, and Syria and other places that they would just go and uh, destroy the ancient monuments, the old temples, the ancient art and so on. Because, you know, your art, your, your, your culture, your statues and so on, 
I mean, they're your roots, right? They're your roots as a culture. They're your roots as a country. And, you know, everybody knows if you take the roots out from a tree, you can just lean against it and push it over, right? So they just take away your history, take away your history at all times. And I actually had this, this an interesting kind of, it's like a balance backlash that occurs because of the Marxist argument. So the Marxist argument in general is that wealth accumulates through exploitation. Um, it's basically paying the workers less than they deserve, less than they're worth. And because the only real value comes from labor um, and you have to underpay your labor in order to make profits, like, you know, you, you sell the, you sell the labor at 15 bucks an hour, but you only pay the worker 14 bucks an hour and you keep that extra dollar. It's simplified. You understand you keep that extra dollar less and you become, you know, do that a million times. You got a million dollars or whatever. So because the Marxists believe that, all wealth comes from exploitation, at least until the Marxist paradise occurs. Because they believe that all wealth comes from exploitation, then any wealthy country is an enemy to virtue because it can only have become wealthy because it stole from other countries and other cultures and so on. Like, you know, as they say, the Americans stole the land of the natives or the Europeans stole the land of the natives. They stole the wealth from India. They stole this, they stole that. And that's the only reason why the Industrial Revolution produced wealth. It's the only reason why there's a modern world is because the West. So by, by being successful, you are a bad culture, a bad guy. It's all exploitation. The rich guy is a bad guy. And it's funny because that's actually in certain sects of Christianity and because maybe other religions as well. It's kind of a religious perspective. You probably heard that saying from the Bible that says it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And this hostility towards wealth, you know, a lot of people have that kind of resentment, you know, because the wealthy guy, he's, uh, you know, he's often pretty good looking. It's funny. I was saying this to my daughter the other day that uh, we saw this old guy with one of these, um, you know, beautiful shocks of, of silver gray hair, you know, full on Samuel Beckett style. And I was saying to her that when I got into business, it was kind of an interesting phenomenon. You probably noticed this as well, that, you know, the sort of top business executives generally have full heads of hair, even though they're in their 60s and 70s. Now, by the time men are in their 60s and 70s, over 90% of them have had some form of hair loss, usually quite significant. I mean, I was a little ahead of the curve. <laughs> Get it, curve? A little ahead of the curve there. But business leaders will often have, you know, these full-on Ronald Reagan heads of hair and all that. And we were sort of discussing as to why. Yeah, it's part of it. It looks like youthful. It looks like fertility and so on. Maybe you gain additional confidence if you're not going through the self-esteem crisis of hair loss or something like that. I don't know. It's been a while since <laughs> that kind of went around the uh, mulberry bush for me. But I do remember seeing that in the business world that, you know, the guys with the nice hair and generally, like when was the last time we had, or you guys had a bald president in America? Well, it was Franklin Delano, sorry, it was, uh, no, gosh, um, not Roosevelt, Eisenhower. Jeez, I should know that. Dwight D. Eisenhower, hero of World War II. He was a bald guy, but that was the last president before TV became very common. And then you got to go with the, you always get the guy with the better hair or it's the taller guy or both who gets in. So that's kind of just the way things play out of this, in this world, that there are these shallow um, standards that people have, which uh, they pretend that they uh, um, making decisions based upon reason and, and all of that. There is also a, um, um, it's an interesting phenomenon. You probably know that, but know about this, but I think it was the early 1960s, late 1950s, early 1960s. There was a debate between Richard Nixon and John F. Kennedy. And half of America had TVs. The other half of America just listened on radio. Now, the people who listened on radio were convinced that Richard Nixon had won. The people who watched on TV and John F. Kennedy Jr. was, sorry, John F. Kennedy was a physical wreck. I mean, he had, what did he, had Addison's. He had like fistfuls of pills for back pain. I mean, he's just a complete wreck. But he was a very good looking guy and had that, you know, that Massachusetts have and kind of accent and put, put the car in the yard. <laughs> How about them apples? And so the people who watched the debate were, were certain that the better looking guy had won. 
the people who listened to the debate on the radio were absolutely um, certain that the anti-communist had won. It was really, really quite, quite interesting, right? It's funny how Nick, Nick Fuentes is still on Twitter and you're not. Yeah, yeah that's, uh, that's funny. Maybe 1% of humans are moved by reason. That is already, uh, that is already a, uh, a challenge uh, for the reality, right? All right, let's see here. You can always try and grow a mustache. Um, Ethan Ralph has a large audience that would be very interested to hear about you being banned on YouTube and Twitter. In hindsight, would you have been more strident in your approach on more controversial topics, knowing you were going to be kicked? Well, you know, but that's, that's first of all, I, I, I'm pretty, pretty clear about all of this. Um, you know, where I feel there is a really important truth to be said. And so, you know, the hindsight, knowing you were going to be kicked, when it comes to a conflict with someone, this is just an important life lesson, I suppose, you can take from this kind of stuff. Hey, it's free. Although, yeah, it impacts financially for sure. If you could help me out, freedomain.com forward slash donate. I'd really appreciate it. That's freedomain.com forward slash donate. Not going to do a big pitch here, but, you know, I'm not going to lie. Wouldn't wouldn't hurt. And um, if you go, if you subscribe through Subscribestar, then we at least for now have a whole community in there that you can be a part of and all of that. So can't guarantee how long that's going to last or anything, but nonetheless. Um, so when it comes to a conflict, be reasonable, be reasonable, be reasonable. And um, for me, at least on Twitter, on YouTube, I mean, as I post, I'm a reasonable guy. I mean, I say things that are true, that at least I believe to be true. If I change my mind, I'll say I've changed my mind and here's why. But be the reasonable person, because if you escalate, and then you get kicked, then you'll kick yourself, <laughs> you know, saying, oh, if I hadn't said this, or I hadn't said that, or whatever, right? And it's like if you're in a relationship with a girl, it's not going that well, or a guy, it's not going that well. They're a little volatile, a little upset, a little crazy, maybe. Stay reasonable, because if they draw you into their crazy world, then you'll never know who's in the wrong, so to speak, right? So stay reasonable and stay positive and operate out of a place of love. It's a beautiful thing to do. And then if you get booted, if, if they break up with you or if you decide to leave them or whatever, then I would say at least you can leave with a good conscience. And leaving with a good conscience is really, really important in life. Regrets are a form of toxicity for sure. JFK was the last anti-communist Democrat. Yeah, it's pretty funny how these things change, right? Pretty, pretty. Uh, somebody says, it was well worth my time joining the community. Yeah, it is the underground freedom bunker. Yeah, I guess so. Does this make you want to potentially switch careers? Well, you know, that's interesting. I've been thinking about that too. It's time to get into rapping. Um, so, you know, it's a... <laughs> It's a bit of a nutty way to, to, to make a living, so to speak, right? I mean, it, it it has its ups, it has its downs, it has its shocks, it has its glories and all of that. So when these kinds of things happen, yeah, sure, of course, everybody sits there and thinks, you know, well, is there another thing that I could be doing? But it's something that John Cleese said, and I try not to get too influenced by these things. And please don't blame John Cleese for being included in this live stream. But John Cleese said, with regards to Monty Python, to Faulty Towers, to A Fish Called Wanda, and so on, he said, you know, most people get a creative peak of like maybe 15 years. And then after 15 years, you know, you kind of chug along. And John Cleese wrote books with psychologists. Uh, he made... Um, well, I guess there was a sequel to A Fish Called Wanda that didn't do very well at all. He made um, instructional videos, uh, safety training videos, uh, corporate videos, and so he did a lot of different things. But, I mean, his early genius, the creativity that came out of you know, Life of Brian and uh, some of the Monty Python stuff was a bit sketchy, but some of it was very, very good. And, um, I mean, some of the 
mad anarchic genius that was uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, and my favorite work of his, uh, which was uh, Faulty Towers, his brilliant, brilliant comedy. So, you know, 15 years. I've been doing this about 15 years. That's right. <laughs> I've been doing this about 15 years. I'm going to be 54 this year. I'm going to be 54 this year. So I was born in 1966. I'm going to be 54 this year. Not even that many months, right? A couple of months. And yeah, so I started this when I was 39. Please tell me I got that math right. <laughs> yeah, 39. And not this live stream, although I may feel that way. But 15 years, that's a long time to be hard at battle with the, uh, with the world. You know, and in battle with the world because I love the world and I love the future and I love our potentials and capacities as a species. That's one species. It's one species. But yeah, there are certainly are times where you sit there and say, oh, it's got to be a got to be a bit of an easier or more predictable way to to make a living. And to some degree, I think at least the problems now are a direct result of the success is earlier or, or the impact earlier, if that makes sense. It's sort of like if you plant a tree and it grows and then it shades the sun. Okay, well, the shade is part of the growth, right? And so in this sense, the shade, in both senses of the word, the shade is part of the growth. And you maybe it's impossible to have the kind of you know positive impact I had on the world without there being a blowback. Maybe that's not really possible given the way the world is constituted, the state is constituted, the laws are constituted, and so on. Maybe it's a yin and yang thing. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. But yeah, for sure. There is a, uh, it does, uh, it certainly does cross your mind for sure. I mean, it'd be crazy if it didn't, right? All right, let's do another couple of questions. It's, uh, it's late for me. You know, when I was younger, this would be, I'd just be starting to go to a disco. Uh, when will you stop asking for donations or should I keep letting you grift me forever? You know, you can just say no, right? <laughs> you know, that's possible, right? We just, you can just say no. And um, if you find value in what it is that I do, I think it's reasonable to work on exchanging value for value. I think that's a reasonable thing to do. If you don't find value in what I do, then you should go do something else. And if you don't want to donate money, that's perfectly fine. And if you don't want to share the videos uh, or podcasts or whatever, that's perfectly fine. Just share the ideas. Yeah, that's that's painful enough for me as well. So you should do a documentary of your life. It must be one hundred percent authentic. Well, that's interesting because I don't really want people to be particularly interested in me, if that makes sense. Um, I want people to focus. See, if they focus on me, they're kind of missing the point of philosophy which is to stimulate thought in you so that you can go out and think and be a great person in the world and change things for the better. So I would say I wouldn't really want people to be that interested in me. I do think that um, it is important to take from philosophy and build it yourself. Right? You've got to change your diet, not just read the diet book. Is it a coincidence that you retweeted Michelle Malkin talking about Ben Shapiro being part of cancel culture? Yeah, I think Ben is a little bit uh, to some degree. Uh, Michelle Malkin has stood up very courageously. I mean, she's a true Valkyrie. Uh, stood up very courageously. And um, no, I, I think she had a good point to make about Ben. He's referred to be in pretty negative ways uh, and all of that. So, Hi, Stefan. Thanks for speaking with me back in December about when to be honest. I mentioned unauthorized.tv at the end. Is it an option? I have so much to do at the moment. I mean, it's a lot of repair to do on the website because all of the links don't lead to YouTube videos anymore. So I got a lot to do right now. I really do appreciate that. I'm sure I will get around to looking at all that kind of stuff. But right now, um, it's a lot of uh, a lot of repair at the moment. Just the fact that you're calling it disco. 
That's funny. You know, I was never considered a nerd in high school. Maybe a little bit when I was very young. In, in grade seven, I started going to the computer lab on Saturdays and learning how to program basic and even assembler from the, uh, the guys who were in the know. It was really, really great education. It served me very well in my software career. But I was never considered to be particularly nerdy. I went through a bit of a nerdy phase uh, with computers, with Dungeons and Dragons and so on, but I didn't really think of myself that way. And then a family member visited me and, you know, suggested, you know, I get cooler clothes, I get a haircut. You know, single moms not very good at dressing their kids for sexual success, as I talk about in one of my novels. And it's so funny. So I got a cool haircut. He taught me how to use some gel back in the day when I could and got some cool clothes. And I went into school with a new haircut, with some cool clothes, with some gel in my hair and... I kid you not, everyone thought I was the new kid. I was like, why Why is no one talking to me? <laughs> you know, people normally talk to me. We normally have our, our chats and all of that. And everyone thought I was the... That's so funny, right? I mean, like, you haven't really changed that much on the inside. And then, oh, I became a bit of a, uh, bit of a player through that whole process because suddenly I was like, hmm, fairly good looking and all that. And... So, yeah, you, when you go through those kinds of transformations, you realize the world is not quite as deep as you, as you, uh, as you think of it, uh, or, or you think it as. Now, I'm so sorry. Again, it's a little, oh, yeah. So um, there was a group of kids who didn't think, who, who thought I was not, not a bad guy, but um, they didn't think I was super cool. Anyway, so I started going to discos when I was, you know, 16, 17 years old, and you know, I, I just love dancing. I love dancing. You know, that free form, throw yourself around the stage like a rubber ball kind of dancing. I learned a couple of moves like the moonwalk and stuff like that. But basically, I was just like Mr. Free Form Dancing. And this is back in the day where you just had amazing dance songs. You know, Depeche Mode's Just Can't Get Enough, really boppy stuff. Uh, even some of Billy, Do Billy Joel's, uh, sorry, Billy Joel's, not Billy Joel's, Billy Idol uh, dancing with myself, a great dance song. Oh, every time, boom, 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 that um, talking heads burning down the house. Ah, watch out. There's a great, great dance song. This is back when you could literally just dance all night and it would be like one killer song. Yes, don't go. Like all the killer songs would be out there. Uh, I never got too much into safety dance. But anyway, um, anyway, so these group of kids who thought I was not super cool or anything, um, they came into the disco. This was a couple of months before I, I left high school. Uh, a semester early because I did some summer classes because I really wanted to get out and get, get on with my life. But um, they were in this disco and they were walking around because I guess they were 18 or whatever. And they were, oh, yeah, because we had grade 13 back then. They were like 18 and they were looking around this disco like it was the coolest thing ever that they were in a disco. And they saw me chatting up a girl and then I took her dancing and I had some pretty cool moves and all that. And I just remember like, <laughs> it was one of these, you know, vaguely and annoyingly satisfying moments in life where... Um, people who think that you're not cool realize, you know, not too bad with the coolness. Not too bad with the coolness. And um, what's your main goal here? Well, just having a chat with my friends tonight. Just having a dance. Yeah, I was glad to be post. Can you do the dance in the sticker? <laughs> I can stir the pot. Apparently I can stir the pot. That's also my, my social media claim to fame as well. Long-time fan, so cap happy to catch my first live stream. Well, thank you. I appreciate that, and thank you. Uh, how gay is this? Epic content, bro. Oh, there's that gif of me when I took my shirt off, and I was making fun of the guy. Oh, man. I've been called a charismatic cult leader. Well, that, yeah, that's an interesting one. That's an old one. That goes back to the 2008, I think it is. That's pretty old by now. Um, and it's, I don't know if you care about the backstory to that at all. Very, very briefly, um, I say that if you are an adult and your parents are relentlessly abusive and you talk about it with them and you try and solve the problem and you go to therapy and under the guidance of your therapist, you know, to me, it's perfectly morally permissible and may in fact even be a very good idea to not see relentlessly abusive people. I just talked about that in my essay tonight as well, which I'll put a link to below. But 
that approach of saying to people, yeah, you don't have to see abusive parents, you know, again, my, my whole thing is, you know, if it's safe, talk about it with them. I've always said this in talk, try and talk it out with them. And if you are considering taking a break from your family of origins, really, really good, a really, really good idea to engage a therapist to help you through that process because it's a really tricky process. And the therapist, of course, is going to have a more uh, intimate and in-depth knowledge of what it is that you're doing. But you don't have to spend time with the relentlessly abusive people. Of course you don't. I mean, you don't choose your parents. Of course you don't. You don't choose your parents. I mean, if we if we praise a woman for leaving an abusive husband and she chose to marry him, but we don't choose our parents. And this is really important for me as a parent. Um, my philosophy of parenting, very briefly, is parent in such a way that if your child could choose anyone in the world to be his or her parent, they would choose you. Right? So you have to parent, right? I mean, the reality is, you know, your, your spouse, if you're married, your spouse can leave you anytime. Right? They can leave you anytime. And so, you know, you... you you have your relationship with your spouse based on the knowledge that they can leave you, right? And I parent, and you guys have listened to my shows about, really like with my daughter. So I parent, if my daughter had the choice of any parent in the world, she would choose me. That's, you know, I mean, it's a little bit of a cheat question because she only knows me as, as a dad, or she only know I'm the only dad she knows, I mean, as her dad. But it's a really good mindset to be in, right? Because the reality is that if you are not allowed to leave abusive people in your life, that's the cult, right? It's all projection, right? So if you are not allowed to leave abusive parents, then that turns the family into a cult. Like you can't possibly dissociate from abusive or destructive people. Like that's not right. That's not healthy. And so, yeah, the, the cult leader thing is, is yeah. And, and this is not even my idea. This is on Dr. Phil's website. This is talked about in a wide variety of, of um, experts and so all that. And I don't tell people to leave their family. Of course not. I just, you know, if they say I can't, I say, well, technically you can, right? Steph, moonwalk for us right now. Sorry, I have the computer on my lap and I'm over 50. <laughs> all right. Let's do another couple of questions. And uh, let's see here. I heard SNN might consider hiring you. I don't know who that is. I assume you don't mean SNL. Can you imagine? My point was you retweeted Michelle Malkin talking about Ben supporting cancel culture on the day you were banned, which is weird. Yeah. Yeah. And I've, I've never had any problems with Twitter. I mean, every now and then, I think like everyone, um, they'd say, hey, someone complained about this tweet, but we, we looked at it and couldn't find any violations or problems. So I didn't um, I didn't have any problems with any of that. I finally found you from the Minds Post. Took me a while to get here. All right. Hair looks great tonight. <laughs> Which one? It's so funny. You got that vague little fringe here, right? This Corona. I'm actually enjoying Parler. Never liked Twitter. Do you remember that whole $1 thing? Oh, gosh. Yeah, that's right. That is right. The $1 thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gosh. This is really digging up the free domain archaeology tonight. Why not? It's late. So the the Chad thing is very interesting. Sorry, the two dollar thing is uh, very interesting. One dollar, one fecking dollar. People say it, right? So, oh gosh, some years ago, oh man, probably twelve or thirteen years ago, uh, I got a donation of two dollars, and I posted it, and I said, I don't mean to sound ungrateful, but right, and that's all I said. And then people hit the roof. Some people, you know, it's a bunch of trolls, I think. And so I ended up having to write this whole essay, which is, look, if someone thinks I'm only worth $2, then they wouldn't bother sending me a $2 donation because it takes more time to go through that process than the $2 is worth, right? So if, and if somebody thinks I'm worth more, but can only afford $2, I don't want their money. Like, please, people, and I say this all the time, do not donate to me what you cannot afford. This is like not, a, please don't don't go without food, right, or anything like that, right? So if somebody is so poor that they can literally only afford $2, I don't want that money. I feel bad about that. I don't want 
the two dollars if that means that they can't take the bus to get to work tomorrow like a please don't right and if they can afford a lot more they think i'm worth more but they only send me two dollars that's because they kind of want to insult me and make me feel like my worth is only my work is only worth two dollars or anything like that right and i've said to people look i mean if you if you only listen to a couple of episodes don't you know if you're just watching this live stream you're just curious you drop in and you're not sure what to make of me or anything like that if you don't if you just listen to a couple of podcasts or you only watch a couple of shows then you don't have to donate <laughs> You don't have to donate anything. I suggest a donation thing for people who like they really dig in. They've listened to 50, 100, 200 podcasts, right up, right? Now I say, you know, 50 cents a show over time, you know, listen to 100 shows. You know, that's usually 150 to 200 hours, you know, 50 bucks. You know, that's something I suggest. People can do whatever the heck they want, right? And that's not too bad. You know, 50 bucks is a couple of movies, right? Uh, well, one night out of the movies, if and when we're ever allowed to go back out for the movies, right? And that's two hours, right? If you spend uh, five bucks on um, five bucks a movie, then 50 bucks gets you 10 movies, which is 20 hours, you know, 15 to 20 hours of entertainment. And so if you've listened to 100 hours of pure philosophy with no commercials, right? No commercials. I've saved people tens of millions of hours of lives by not having commercials and not having that distraction and not having that interruption and not having the people ever get up and fast forward or just sit and suffer through it or whatever right and so yeah that's my suggestion but anyway so then people said you know i spit on people who who donate to me who don't donate too much money or anything like that it's like no i i that that wasn't my point at all that wasn't my point at all my point is that well i've already gone through it so you understand right but this is the honey it's, it's like that myth that i posted as a woman on my own video of the frozen video or something like that when that was just a weird way that uh, google plus handled your comments see you used to get a youtube channel you used to have to open up a um or to, to comment on youtube you used to have to open up a google plus account and then you'd post under that google plus account so when i retweeted from google plus it showed up under youtube as that woman's comment you can still find her original comments and all that kind of stuff so Uh, is parlor a cyber ghetto for conservatives? Um, I don't think it's a ghetto exactly. Um, let's see here. Donating to the Steph train tonight. Yeah, freedomain.com forward slash donate. I appreciate that. It's very kind. Very, very kind. Why are you afraid to debate Nick? Oh, man, these, you're so scared. <laughs> Come on, man. Stefan, will you do a stream about your experiences under the Groiper curse? Oh, is that a thing? Is that is that a thing? Um, that that if you go, if if you incur the wrath or the displeasure of the Groipers, that you go under some sort of curse and your life goes badly? Is that is that the kind of food we're talking about in a show devoted to rational philosophy? Uh, what they what they mean by ghetto is it's an isolated area with limited reach. Well. Um, I don't really know what to say about that. Um, I mean, everything that starts is a ghetto, right? Uh, everything that starts uh, small, which really generally everything starts small that way, right? But everything that starts small is kind of like a ghetto, right? I mean, that's just the way, you know, I mean, Twitter was a ghetto relative to MySpace and all that. So MySpace was a ghetto relative to Oh, Teladon. Oh, let's really go back. Let's really go way back when, right? So, let's see here. Let's do one more question or two. Parlor likely has too many mainstream people to be considered a ghetto. I don't think that's kind of true. I think that's kind of true. Do you think they banned you because of the 2020 election? I don't know. I mean, it certainly seems pretty proximate. It certainly feels pretty proximate. What can we say or not say to get the ban hammer? Don't know. Don't know. Would you support your daughter marrying a minority? You mean like white soon? <laughs> you inspired me to have children. I now have two sons. Well, congratulations. Well, 
Congratulations. This reminds me of the early Skype days now, Steph. Oh yeah, I guess that's true, right? I guess that's true. Just look at your relative engagement on Parler, then you won't think it is a ghetto. Hmm. Could be the case. Debate my idol and it won't change my mind, but do it anyway. Killstream, will you come on? Yeah, I can uh, I can look into that. Are most of the videos on your channel backed up? Yeah, so you can go to bitshoot.com and we're still getting some of the older videos up, but BitChute has most of the latest videos. You can also go to LBRY and uh, you can get my videos there as well. We're working on it with Brighteon and yeah, more of that stuff. All of that stuff. Parler has gone from 500,000 to 5 million us users in two weeks. Um, why do social apps always want to access your address book? I don't know. I really don't know, but uh, it wouldn't be my recommendation. Do you feel down and out, Steph? Um, I try I try hard, and I, it's fairly successful. But I, I try to take the world as it is and not to wish for things that don't happen or regret too much the things that do happen. I mean, unless I've done something egregious and terrible or whatever it is, right? But what did I tweet about today? I tweeted about Iceland having a very low crime rate despite having high gun ownership. Um, what else? Oh, I tweeted about um, now is kind of like the perfect time to push for tax credits for homeschoolers because you know schools may not even be opening in the fall. Um, I'm not sure that social media truly enjoyed my documentary on Hong Kong and the history of Chinese communism. Pretty sure that was not massively enjoyed by a lot of that kind of stuff. So, Would you consider karaoke? I've heard you sing. I would consider karaoke. Is that something that's, that's, something that's going on on, uh, on Friday? Is that right? Gab is a thousand times better than Parler. Oh, Gab is cool, for sure. I've never been censored on Gab, you say. Oh, appreciate that. Appreciate you saying that. Yeah, the Gap guys have certainly taken some hits for it as well. All right, and the Fed is a very good. Tax credit for homeschools is definitely the political message we need while the country is burning. Well, but homeschooling has some significant advantages over government schooling, namely a lot less propaganda, at least I hope. And it is, of course, propaganda that I think got us into, or got America and the West into a lot of this kind of mess already, so... We shall see. All right, at the Ralph retort. Okay, yeah, um, I, I can I can check out with those guys. We'll see. We'll see. Wyoming, highest gun ownership in the U.S. and one of the lowest crime rates in the U.S. Wyoming, in fact, has more gun ownership than any other. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? All right. Well, I'm going to. Gosh, one twenty-six a.m. Very nice to chat with you guys, and I uh, wanted to sort of give you my thoughts on what happened today, and um, we shall see how things play out going forward, but it was wonderful to uh, chat with you guys, and uh, freedomain.com forward slash donate, as you know, to uh, help me out, which is very much appreciated, though absolutely not required, of course, as you know, but yeah, lots of love here, and um, please please do check out my essay. You can go to freedomain.com, just click on the uh, blog, and you know what, I'll just save this now, so it will stick to the top of the blog. So you go to freedomain.com, click on the blog, and the top will be what I believe, and I hope that you will um, read it. I hope that you will share the webpage or the ideas or uh, my work as a whole, because I obviously think it's very, very important for us to try and have a peaceful coexistence in this world. Philosophy or bust. Philosophy or bad things as a whole. So, all right. Well, uh, essay was solid. Thank you, Jason. I appreciate that. I appreciate that very much. So yeah, freedomain.com forward slash blog. You can check it out or just go to freedomain.com and click on the blog. And um, yeah, lots of love for me up here. I will keep you guys posted about what is happening going forward, but uh, I really do appreciate chatting with you guys tonight, and have yourselves a great, great evening. I'll talk to you soon. Bye!